Well, hello and welcome to the Music Money Podcast. Today, my guest is David Andrew Weeb. David is the five-time self-published and three-time best-selling author of the new music industry and the Music Entrepreneur Code. He's the founder and CEO of Music Entrepreneur HQ, and is a, he's a staff writer of Music Industry How To, and he's been podcasting about the music business for over 11 years. Music Revolt CEO and founder Scott Kirby called him the king of internet music marketing. He travels the world as he writes, makes music, and eats delicious food. Which <laughs> I'm I'm totally into all of those things, writing, music, and delicious food. So we have a lot in common. Uh, David, welcome to the Music Money Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. All right. My pleasure. So I wanted to dive into a book that you wrote called The Essential Guide to Music Entrepreneurship. Mm. And um, so entrepreneurship is, a, is something that's near and dear to my heart. I, I've been an entrepreneur off and on throughout my career. I don't know that I've ever really been all that great one, great of a one, but um, now a music and entrepreneur, I do pretty well. I, actually, I'd, I'd love it if you just start off defining that. Is that a music entrepreneur just in the music business or a musician who is an entrepreneur or all of the above? Yeah, the answer is definitely all of the above. And we look at it a little bit differently than pretty much everyone else after or since has looked at it because we've seen copycats. We've seen people take it from an anti-establishment standpoint, and I've never been completely anti-establishment. I've always been the guy to say, if you want to work with a record label, you can still leverage music entrepreneurship to get to your career to the point where you can work with a record label. And so it really is just applying the mindset and the business and the digital marketing principles to create multiple income or revenue streams to support your career to the point where you can work with others, work with the label, choose your own path in whatever it is you want to accomplish in music. If you want to go completely independent, I know a lot of artists that are doing that, making six figures, and that's really not the upper limit. You could easily make seven figures if you had the right structures in place. And so, especially today, you know, people say there's not enough income sources and that's not true. There's more than there's ever been in the music industry for artists. What then, what would be the difference of somebody who sees themselves as a music entrepreneur and just a musician? Yeah, it's pretty much self-determined. We self-identify as music entrepreneurs. And why would we do that? Because it's empowering, because it feels like that is something you would aspire to or want to be. Now, not everybody's going to look at that term music entrepreneur, or we could even say music entrepreneur and say, you know, immediately that's what I want to be. That's why I've approached it from a few different angles. I've sometimes called it being a creative alchemist. And that's something that immediately gets artists perking up going, I like that. I do combine different modalities to create what I create. Exactly. We all do. Or I say the rene renegade musician, which is almost a take on, we had a conversation earlier before we started recording about Dan Kennedy. Well, <laughs> he had the renegade millionaire system mm -hmm. and I created the renegade musician because I was just like, we're not trying to adhere to, you know, the norms. You are really are a business person when you get into music because you have to choose and you have to do all the activity pretty much yourself. It's like, it's true. there's, there's so few opportunities like straight out of school for musicians. Like yeah. most musicians will come out of school, not knowing the first thing about social media, building a website, um, digital marketing, <laughs> anything that could yeah. actually help them in, in moving their career forward. And then you want to get a chair on the orchestra. It's like, you're probably what the 15th violin player <laughs> in line to right. for that position. Right. It's exactly. super tough. It's really tough. And so we just want to begin to look outside of those opportunities and be self-determined and going, okay, um, what are the venues I can play, but not just what are the venues I can play? What are the alternative venues I can play? Where are people not playing in my city that I could potentially play? And you might even be able to cut better deals with those venues because they don't generally have musicians in, but they're interested in having artists come and perform to for a grand opening or some kind of special event or a sale. That's interesting. I mean, we think of it and I'm, I don't know if you're familiar. I'm, I have a, an eight piece funk band with mm. a three piece horn section and we've been around for about nine years and we do originals, but we also do covers and, you know, we got a lot of notoriety in our early days as being this dance band and we started 
you know, drawing large crowds. And, you know, the, the, that was a good thing. It was a great thing, actually, but it was a bad thing in Sarasota, Florida, where there were no large venues hardly. And so I started looking for opportunities for us to, to go and play places that were not traditional just so we could fit the crowds in, in the room and we could make more money. And so I, um, we, we actually got to play a private event at a uh, Shriners facility. Hmm. I don't know if you know for the Shriners, they're uh, yes. kind of a, one of those fraternal organizations, kind of like um, the Rotary or something like that. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and they had this big, really nice ballroom and we played this private event there and, you know, the people were really nice and they came up to us and just like, man, you guys are such a great band. Um, we're about to do a grand opening cause we just renovated this room. And I was like, man, that's really fantastic. And so with my, my marketing, cause we, we had developed a list at that time, probably around 3000 people who had bought tickets from our, our other shows that we had done. I said, tell you what, and he's like, well, I just want to do a free event and, uh, you know, just have as many people as possible come into the room just to see the place. And I said, well, I could help you out with that. So they hired the band. We did the free event. Ton, you know, I mean, the place was absolutely packed. I mean, they mm. gave away, I mean, they were giving away free booze and free food. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but then right after that, they said, could we do this once a month? And I said, well, yes, we can, you <laughs> know, and, and I shot them a price that, you know, was not, you know, well, they, they had already paid me a pretty good for price already. And we continued that for about a year and it became a thing, you know, mm. and it was just self-feeding and, and I had, you know, but it was just one opportunity met another, I was looking for a place, you know, we have, you know, and, and it just, again, like you mentioned, just talking to people and this, this guy was, a, he, was an, he was an older, older man and he didn't know the first place to start. Now on the marketing side, I didn't have to help him with the marketing. I mean, that's, that's something that, um, you know, a lot of bands would have said, you know, you know, that's not, they're paying me to come basically service their clientele. I, I don't, shouldn't have to draw people in from my crowd. It's kind of a non-traditional thing, you know, and I'm thinking, why would I do that? You know, <laughs> why wouldn't I help this guy out? Not that I was just, but it's, it, you know, I just, I saw the opportunity and I did naturally want to help them. I wanted them to succeed. And, um, sure enough, it, it went on and became a thing. And, and, uh, we got, I actually got other bands to play there as well. And it became, you know, people were excited about it. In fact, the only problem we had is their staff wasn't exactly ready for the number of people that we were able to bring in there and, mm. <laughs> you know, kind of tough to get a drink and all that, but that was another story. But, uh, but that's just one form of just kind of looking for non-traditional opportunities. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, to, to play somewhere. In fact, I know there was a, there was another story that a friend of mine told me about. He was, they were struggling to get gigs and, uh, there was one of these bowling alleys that was doing kind of one of those, uh, mm. night bowling, rock and roll bowling kind of things. Yep. So they, they literally, they had, they set up the band right above where all the bowling pins were. It's just like, the, you know, so we're out there playing and we're hearing these bowling pins like just being knocked over so the crowd loved it and it got to be a thing after a while and it got us we were able to develop a crowd after that and then start getting booked in in you know in local venues so there's a couple stories maybe for you um so okay so let's let's just back up a little bit so um so maybe what are some some of the activities that a somebody who considers them a music entrepreneur would do as opposed to somebody who just thinks of themselves as a musician? Yeah, that's a really great question. And there's no one size fits all. I think perhaps you've discovered the same thing over many years. I know that I have, that there's no one thing that works amazingly or perfectly for everyone or produces the same results every single time. It's very individual. That said, you know, if I were to list some things off that I could see a music entrepreneur doing, they would probably create a schedule. A lot of artists just go by the seat of their pants and say, yeah. let's, you know, okay, we're tonight, we're going to rehearse and drink beer and eat pizza and watch the hockey game or whatever. It's good to have, you know, team bonding. We, we often did that in my band as well, but I think you would probably begin to create a schedule and go, okay, so what do we need to do? And look seriously at digital marketing with social media activity, updating and maintaining your website. When are you going to make phone calls? When are you going to go network with mm. people? When are you going to start getting outside of, of your own 
you know, small city or town or fan base and, and begin expanding? Can you start going in concentric circles and start looking for nearby cities and towns two hours away, five hours away, seven hours away, begin to identify all the opportunities. I had a band mate or band leader. I used to play in a tribute band. Actually, I guess I still do. I just happen to live in a different area than everybody else in the band. But in that tribute band, the band leader systematically identified every possible gig opportunity in the province of Alberta, Canada. Now, <laughs> Alberta is big, but in terms of mm. population, it's not. It's about 3 okay. million people, if I understand correctly. <laughs> so, But he went around and just like systematically, okay, what is there what, in terms of pubs and bars and clubs and festivals? And, and yeah. you know, out of that came a few like really profitable solo gigs for me as well. Nice. So that kind of thing is worth doing. And I think it's the same thing in every area. It's like, what structures do you have? Do you have a gig checklist as mm. far as like what you're going to bring? Do you have a set list taped to your guitar or, or snare? Yeah. Do you, you know, do you have a backup for your batteries and instrument cables and microphones and, and drumsticks and everything else that could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Being prepared is is really huge as as a music entrepreneur and so yeah i think i listed off a lot of activities there that that a music entrepreneur yeah. would engage in you hit in some great points uh for one on a set list i mean i writing a set list i believe is a is a skill um yeah. writing a great set list for one you need to have great songs um and you know but the flow of a show you know, you know, now I've seen some bands kind of take this to the extreme. Like there's, there's this one band I'm thinking of in town that they will literally play 15 songs back to back without stopping, mm. but they do like these little two minute versions of each one. And it's like their, their whole band is about high energy. I mean, they're very popular, so it's working for them, but they're a little too high energy for me or, or I'm, mm. I'm just kind of like, I really like that song. I wish they would have played the whole thing, you know, but right. that's, that's just my own personal opinion. Um, but I do think that, you know, having a show that flows one song right into the, right into the next, you know, with, um, and then if you're going to say something between songs, have an idea what you're going to say before you get up on the mic. Um, <laughs> yes. you know, don't, and, and like with me, I've got eight people on our band and a lot of them have microphones and I'm like, guys, when, when all of us get up on the mic and we think we're being cute and we're talking or, or joking around for half the, most of the time, the audience can't hear what we're saying, you know, cause if we're talking to the mic like this or this is the kind of mm -hmm. stuff and, you know, and you don't think about it. And, and of course we're up there cutting up, we've got in-ear monitors. We can, we think we're great. We're, we're hilarious, but the audience has no idea what we're saying. So, I mean, yeah. stuff like that and just be, you know, if you're going to say something on the mic, say it, mean it get back to the next song and get, stick with the list. I mean, it drives me nuts when I go see a band and I can tell there's no set list and they're all looking at each other between songs, kind of, you know, like, call, you know, Hey, you know, uh, so-and-so what key I'm like, Oh, this is going to be great. You know? Uh, and then, uh, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and another, another thing that you, that you led on to was, was, um, knowing all the gigs and, and I, I thankfully that I don't have to do the booking anymore. We've got, we've got a mm. manager that does all the booking. And one thing I can say about him and he's actually, we actually have a guy that's semi-famous that, that works for us as a manager. Uh, his name's Artie Fletcher. He's an actor and a comedian. He worked on, you know, doesn't matter because people will still will not call him back. He will not, I, I mean, he has to yeah. a lot of sometimes physically go there, but see, he was the, he was like the youngest booking agent in his, in his earliest job that he had, like right out of, uh, out of college, he worked for the largest agency in New York. And so he was trained by the best in the, in the most competitive market. And he said, you have got to be absolutely relentless, you know, to the point where, you know, he said, all I really want is a yes or a no. You know, it just, and you know, our band has a good name around here and it's like, but we're not exactly cheap. And he's just like, it's, it's either yes or no, but you know, but I may have to call. There's one venue that I know that he emailed and called 30 times. Now we, we finally got in there and we played three shows, sold the place out three times in a row, but it took a year and a half for them to even acknowledge his, that he was even contacting him. You know, that kind of persistence, if you can find somebody like that, that will go to the wall for you, you know, they are absolutely worth every penny. Um, you know, oh, there's not yeah. a lot of arties out there. 
<laughs> it's it's a quid pro quo type situation for sure. It's like I often tell artists, no one's going to manage you if you're not already making five figures most of the time. It's like they're only going to take, what, 10 to 12%, maybe 50% of your total. It's like, how are they going to make a living on you? And then the other side is the manager you know, they have to do their work to improve their worth worth to the band by showing up and making the calls and, and doing the legwork, just as you said. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you make a great point is that if you want to attract a manager, you've got to already have gigs. If you want to attract an agent, you have to already have gigs. And the only way that I've ever seen to make that happen is to get out there. And it's just, it's grunt work. Yeah. You know, it really is. And, and, you know, but it, you have to believe in what you're doing and believe in your music and, you know, but even better, if you have a crowd with, with the venues that you've done, if you start generating a crowd, word will get around, you know, it depends on how large a market you're playing in, but it didn't take long in our, I'm wearing a small market, at least in, with Sarasota, it's a small town. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't take long for word to get around that there was this new band that was drawing a crowd. And so calling the other venues and of course you use that as your foothold. Well, we played at the beach club last weekend and the place was packed. Oh, really? Okay. You know, that's what they really want to know. But if you don't have that going for you, then, you know, I'd, I'd say the next most promotional, the, the next best promotional tool is, is a, an excellent promo video. Mm. That's absolutely right. Video is a powerful, powerful medium these days. And there was even stories last year where artists, made it look like they were bigger than they were. And in fact, it turned out they had no audience whatsoever. <laughs> I yeah. mean, don't do that. Right. But no, it no. just goes to show that how much credibility and authority and authority is conveyed through video these days. Yeah, no question. I mean, it's a uh, fact I, <laughs> I've told this story before. I, I was in a band about eight years ago that did nothing but weddings. The wedding oh, yeah. market is huge in yeah. Florida. You know, I, there are people from Canada who come down to, you know, and it's cause it's the place where you can have a beach wedding. Right. Yeah. And, um, so the, pay, the bands could get paid very well. It's not uncommon for a, a wedding band to get from anywhere from 10 to 20 grand to play a wedding. That's and, right. Um, so this, this band that I joined this promo video that they had, the entire thing was lip synced. The tracks that they used were actually karaoke tracks. Oh, no. They didn't, you know, so they're out there literally just like lip syncing. Uh, I mean, the vocals were real, but then the rest of the music was just a, literally go to karaoke version.com and you'll find their, their music that they were, that they oh, were karaoke yeah. to. And now the band was actually quite good. Um, but that video, that promo video alone was worth at least $150,000 worth in sales. Wow. Because, you know, when it comes to booking wedding bands, you know, especially if you're, if they're looking from out of state, looking to hire a band in Florida, they don't know they're going to, you know, all these rich people coming down and they're going to hire somebody. They're going to just watch a bunch of promo videos, maybe talk to a couple booking agents down here and they're going to hire a band site unseen other than their video. So, you know, having a, pr- a high quality promo video, I mean, it can pay massive dividends. And, you know, what I would say in the very beginning, if you have a band that you really believe in it, or you're, you're a, uh, even a solo artist, just scrape your pennies together and put together a great promo video and then just promote the crap out of that. Um, you know, and, and you could do quite well. Yeah. As a wedding band, you'd basically have to be able to show that you can cover a lot of ground, eighties, nineties, two thousands, Lionel Richie, Katy Perry, you know, a Keith Urban, yeah. you got to be able to do all the romantic covers. So if you can't do that, but if you can show, you can do that on video. Oh yeah. You're going to get yeah. some bookings and your vocals have to be really strong. That's, yeah. that's the other big thing. Mm-hmm. The average person, I really believe they judge the, you know, the, how good quote unquote a band is, especially a cover band is by the quality of their vocals for better or for worse, you know, cause we played in I played in a tribute band for Def Leppard. Well, mm. <laughs> Def Leppard sounds incredible in the studio live. They don't sound yeah. quite like that, but people don't even know that. Right. So we're duplicating Def Leppard live and people are, sometimes would complain about the vocals and we're like, all right, okay. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> Yeah, that's where, uh, you know, I'd say playing with tracks, you know, especially those, you know, yes, the Def Leppard exactly. were, were, you know, what was it? Mutt Lang was infamous for, <laughs> you so know, the producer layers. would make them do, they had like a hundred backup vocals on there. 
Exactly. Yeah. So if you didn't have those, you know, I, I, I that's not something I wouldn't want to do, you know, pour, pour some sugar on me without those big giant vocals. Well, and there's some but, one of a um, kind vocalists. Okay, so let's talk about there's some one of a kind vocalists oh, yeah. like, you know, Joe, yeah. Joe even, is one of those. And then I've never heard another Sammy Hagar myself. So like some vocalists that are pretty difficult to emulate, I guess yeah. that's just a point to like pick your, pick your battles. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if, if, if you're going to do a tribute act, especially, I mean, the singers just has to be dead on, you yeah. know, um, Unless of course you're Van Halen and, and then your Eddie Van Halen guy has to be dead on. That's, uh, but that's another challenging story. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about the four pillars of success in music. You mentioned your book. Mm. The first is talent and create creative ability. Mm-hmm. Why is this important for a music entrepreneur? It's the foundation. I mean, I don't know how you're going to do anything without that. (laughs) Um, I've been to a lot of gigs and as I'm sure you have too, and I appreciate every artist, every single person who goes on stage, puts themselves out there and just lays it all to waste. And I've seen groups that were not great and they did not improve and they kept showing up and disappointing audiences and it kept dwindling. And it's like, we, uh, you have to be part of this evolution. You have to strive to be better every single time or else there's only so many times your sister and your brother and your aunt and uncle are going to yeah. show up to your gigs and you yeah. really got to be become an entertainer. So it's good uh, to gain live experience. That is powerful. You're going to develop way faster outperforming than you are in your basement. But we have to balance that with, okay, what what went well? this past gig, what did not go well and how can we improve that? And, and so often it's just really simple mistakes, like starting off with a really dreadfully sad and slow ballad. Yeah. (laughs) It's usually not a great thing to start a set list with. And then ending on a note, that's just kind of like, Oh, we're out of time. Sorry. Bye. We have to start strong and end strong because that's all people remember. They don't remember the middle all that much. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, those are, those are great points. I mean, um, you know, you got to start with a good solid, you know, I, I usually start with, you know, hold on, I'm coming. That's a, just a, a song that people love, but it's a simple song, you know, and, and it's, I do that kind of for the sound man. I do it for the band because I know that we can, you know, it's not complex. We just hit them. You know, I just love it because the song starts right in, you know, people are like, oh, I recognize that right out of the gate, but it's, it's a punchy song. Plus it hits all of our vocals so they can, they can check all the levels, make sure that, I mean, we get a little sound check, but sometimes we don't. And that's a good sound check song, um, you know, for the, for the sound man, but it's also punchy and simple for the crowd. Uh, You know, it's not a barn burner, but it's a good one to start off with. And then, you know, a lot of times we would end, we have this epic version of Purple Rain that we do that, ah. burn, that burns the house down. You know, we, yeah. we kind of put our own spin on it, um, you know, and the crowd just goes nuts. And we give that, we try to give them a concert experience, you know, to where like, to where they're talking to their friends, like, oh my God. And then they, the guitar player just nailed the solo. And then we thought it was over and the sax player came out and did this amazing wailing solo and it built back up. You, you know, we kind of give them that rise and you know again we want them it's it's not just a cover band gig they're at a concert by that point Mm. um you know and it still gives me chills when you know when we have that night and people are just like you know they want an encore because you know that song as simple as it is and you know it's never my favorite prince song but still sure i've I've kind of thought to myself often i was just like man this this song is so simple but people absolutely love this the song it moves people Yes. You know, and especially, you know, guys my age, you know, we start thinking about when, cause that came out when I was in high school, you know, <laughs> and, and I start having those visions of, you know, of dancing to this when I was, you know, in high school dances <laughs> and stuff, you know, and, and, uh, carries them back. But, um, okay. So, let's see, you said the next pillar to music success uh, or music entrepreneur success is people skills. What, what, do good people skills look like for a music entrepreneur? Yeah. People skills. Another term for that would be communication, conversation, 
really the ability to make friends. It, that's where it all kind of starts. Can you mm. shake a hand, right? We've yeah. all heard about different ways of shaking hand. And uh, I think people read it and they still do it wrong a lot of the time. <laughs> mm. uh, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, the web of, of the thumb or the hand mates, meets with the other person's web of the hand mm. and not too firm, right? They say firm handshake, but you, you're not crushing their hand. No, no. right. Unless you're, just, unless you're trying to be like out guy, some guy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know? And flex can, your biceps. And can you, you know? smile when you, and can yeah. you look in them in the eye? Not, not in a creepy way. Just can you hold a gaze for a few seconds while you're talking to them? Can you be attentive enough to listen? And so often people go, that was such a great conversation. Thank you so much. And then all you did was listen, right? You didn't say mm-hmm. much of anything about yourself. And then finally they're just like, hey, what about you? Can, can do you have a website? <laughs> can I get your business yeah. card? And yeah. so it's just really practicing that generosity and conversation. I think that's how Dale Carnegie put it in, in how to win friends and influence people pretty much everything in there. You know, there was a young band, uh, the middle coast, I think they were originally called something else, but, and, and they're not together anymore, but in, in Canada, I just saw them doing a really great job. And then I kind of wondered like, huh, I wonder how these guys figured out to do all this stuff. They're only in their young, young you know, early twenties. And it yeah. turns out they all read how to win an inference, how to win friends and influence people and base their entire philosophy on it. So I said, wow, wow, good job. And that's yeah. what that's what people should do. Read that book and actually take it seriously. Don't just be like, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're not doing it. Trust me, you're not doing it. Actually practice what's in there. That's that's great advice. That that is perfect. I've never heard of a band doing uh, doing yeah. that, but you know, but I've heard of certainly heard of plenty of entrepreneurs or salespeople that have read that classic book. I mean, it should be required reading. I think it should yeah. require my my kids to read that book. Um, but you know, I, I was thinking about that. Another technique, I don't know that I use it consciously, but I was thinking about, you know, using open-ended questions. So like, you know, when somebody comes up and says, Hey, you got, you know, I go walk up to the bar on break and you know, the, Hey, you guys are great. You know, and a lot of times just by default, they will say, Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Where are you guys from? And, mm. you know, cause we, you know, in Florida, <laughs> you're dealing with a lot of people, you know, unless of course there are other people I've seen with the band before, but you know, a lot of times we get tourists. Oh, you know, we're from Canada. We're down here in Florida on vacation. Oh, that's great. Great. You guys staying on the beach or where are you staying? You know, it's something like that. And, you know, and just like, and how'd you hear about the band? But see what you know, what I'm not doing is I'm not asking them closed ended questions, which are questions that they have to answer with either a yes or a no, because the conversation then probably not going to go or, you know, go anywhere. Oh, what'd you think of the band? You know, that's an opening question, but they're, they're probably just going to say, Oh, you guys are great. Right. You know, they're, they're not going to be like, well, you know, you guys could tighten up. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not, gonna, they're not, you know, but just asking about them, the time that they're having, or, you know, how did you hear about us? Maybe, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just something to get them talking. You know, it's classic direct marketing, but knowing the form, family, occupation, recreation message, yeah. You know, really starting there. So it's like, where are you from? That's a good family oriented question. Mm-hmm. Occupation. Hey, what do you do? Um, yeah. Recreation. What do you like to do in your spare time? Mm-hmm. And then message. Well, that's if you, if there was a real connection in the conversation, if there wasn't, you would just leave that alone. But if there was a real connection in that conversation, you might follow up with, Hey, well, we have our music up on our website. Would sure appreciate you checking it out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, those, those are good tips and it's simple enough, you know, but when, when people come up there to, um, especially if they're there to buy your merch, you're at the merch table and stuff like that. And, um, you know, go ahead and offer to, to, to sign it for them. I mean, and, and maybe, you know, those are the people, cause those are people, I mean, come on, man, you yeah. know, they're taking your t-shirt, you're, they're yeah. taking your CD home. I mean, I know there's some people that buy our CDs that don't even have CD players, you right. know, that they, they literally just, they just want to contribute. And, you know, I mean, yes, we, we enjoy tips. I mean, that's, that's cool too. But I always tell people, I said, look, if you're going to give us 10 bucks, take a CD with it, you know, I, I, cause I want you to take our music home and I'd love, you know, nothing turns me on more than seeing somebody mouthing the words to a song that I wrote, or when we start into that song, that original, that I can see that look on their face, like, Oh, I know this one. This is, this is one of my favorites. I mean, there's, and, and those people that come to the merch table, those are the ones, 
you know, so spend a little extra time with those people, yes. man, show them some love. And they, and because, and you may think it's weird, you know, cause you're just some schmo that, you know, during the, during the week, you've got some day job working at wherever, but they see you as a rock star or they think, yeah. you know, they think that you're going to be big time someday, or they maybe are, they think you're already big time, you know, or at the very least they see you as doing something really cool with your life. And maybe they're not, you know, it's, you know, this little star struck, if you will. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's see, talk about the next is business sense. What kind of business <laughs> acumen does a music entrepreneur need to develop? Yeah. This is a big one, isn't it? Because yeah, it is. the music business is so siloed into different pieces and different corners. We, we mentioned various revenue streams and, and royalty collection companies, organizations, um, it, it kind of starts there. It's like, if you don't have the knowledge of that, then, then you can't collect everything that's owed you. So mm. you do need to get a handle on what are, what are these companies? What are these organizations? What forms do I need to sign to be able to collect everything that I could possibly be owed? And, and it's active. It, it's not just passive. A lot of it, some of you have to register your songs as you, as you upload and release new yeah. music, you have to submit forms. Um, I think there's live performance royalties now with a lot of performance rights organizations. You got to submit your live set and proof and tickets and all that kind of stuff. So it's, oh, wow. yeah, it's like active and ongoing. If you want to collect all that, you kind of almost need an administrative department or a few hours in your week dedicated to just sorting through and organizing all that and yeah. other other business acumen it it almost comes down to a lot of the things we've already talked about networking and connecting if you're going to see yourself as a music business then businesses connect with other businesses right I, I managed to book a little bit of a local showcase at a Starbucks in Calgary. And then I had mm -hmm. an, afterwards I had artists come up to me and say, how did you book a gig here? And I said, well, it was pretty simple. I work for a company called Toon City. We all have these business cards. And the moment I showed this business card to them and approached them with the idea of having, you know, people from my company come in along with some mm -hmm. artists, along with an audience, they were all about it. You know, as long as it was acoustic and it wasn't anything super disruptive, they were all about it. They were happy to do it. And and you can do the same thing. Anybody can do the same thing. Print up a business card and say, you know, I'm not, I'm the guitarist from so-and-so, but like, hey, this is my company. This is what we do. And then there's so many more w venues and businesses willing to work with you. That's interesting because you, you almost have to put your shoe on the other foot and think in terms of, okay... What does the manager, no, and no offense to any managers of Starbucks listening, <laughs> but what does the manager of Starbucks know about booking an act to come in and play, play at their place? Right. Probably not much. Not much. And that's, and that's really the truth is going to be that that's with wedding bands or even with corporate bands, you know, somebody, um, you know, they've got a corporate gig, they are willing to spend five grand to hire a band, come, come to play their Christmas party. And, you know, maybe some secretary has been tasked with the job. Who in the hell is she going to call? Mm -hmm. You know, and she's just like, seriously, I haven't been out to a nightclub. And, and, you know, since <laughs> I was in my twenties, I don't know anything about this, but she's been tasked by the boss. So who's she going to call? Well, she's probably going to go to Google. And is she going to look yeah. up bands? Probably not. She's no. going to look up agencies. Mm. So that's why agencies exist. You know, is I think it's there. They, they, exist as this buffer between, you know, the guy that they remember that was throwing up in the back of a, of a van that was in a, it was in a band when they were in high school and they, they, that is not what they want to book for their corporate corporate party. So, you know, this is leading to conversation about booking agents, but that's where booking agents can really come in, you know, cause I've, it's been very rare that I booked a corporate event, which we played many, they almost always come through booking agents because right. I think the corporate said they just, they're more comfortable dealing with an entity that they perceive to be professional. <laughs> and that's really not the case. A lot of times with, with bands necessarily, you know, even though you can carry yourself professional so that I, you know, I'd say 
absolutely. You know, again, but you get, you need to be out there booking yourself actively and getting yourself busy and being seen, you know, develop that, that promotional video before you uh, approach an agent. But I'd say approach every agent in your area Mm. Um, because, you know, for one, they need talent. Yeah. Agents, you know, if they don't have talent, they have nothing to sell and they have, you know, now one word of advice too, that I would say is don't, you know, I remember one of the first agents I talked to the first thing, first thing he said in the first 60 seconds that I talked to him was he wanted an exclusive. It's like, well, most of my bands are exclusive. And I told him, I said, stop right there. (laughs) <laughs> I said, I'm just going to tell you, I said, look, I will, I will send you as much work as we can. And if you feel free and I will never let you down and we will play, we'll go bend, bend over backwards to, to do great for your clients. But I would never sign an exclusive arrangement with somebody that I just met. That yeah. would just be foolish. No kidding. You know, because I am not going to sit around and wait for my phone to ring when I have seven other guys in a band who are trusting me to keep this band busy because they could go play with other bands, yeah, you know? And he was like, well, you know, and I just said, it's really kind of a take it or leave it decision, you know? Exactly. I mean, I've had people approach me out of the blue and I don't know from them, them from Adam. And after one phone call wanted to be a business partner, <laughs> I said, look, your LinkedIn profile yeah. already has me suspicious. Appar- <laughs> apparently you're an executive in 20, 30 companies. I'm yeah. not saying it's not true. I'm not saying you're not that <laughs> guy. Maybe you are just by buying your way in or whatever it is. But yeah, uh, after one phone conversation and we don't even live anywhere close near each other, yeah. it's not yeah, going to work. Really. Yeah. Yeah. We should date before we get married. Uh, That's right. Maybe, or maybe we shouldn't even date. I don't know. Exactly. Um, okay. So now I also read in your book about the principle of a mastermind. Mm. Uh, and so for people that are not even, they've maybe heard that term batted around, but they didn't know what it means. What is a mastermind and why would it be of value specifically to a music entrepreneur? Yeah. The, the definition of it has broadened considerably since its introduction. I believe it was Think and Grow Rich with Napoleon Hill. Napoleon mm. Hill's original definition of a mastermind was you can pick any 12 people, your council, living or dead, and imagine in your mind as if you were meditating and ask each of them questions about your current circumstance and what they would have you do. I've mm. tried that myself and it's actually pretty remarkable <laughs> the answers you can yeah. get. Yeah. But the mastermind has also brought in to include basically a group of people getting together looking to grow their business or looking to grow their careers or looking to grow their freelancing in some capacity. Sometimes it's a group of people who are in different industries and sometimes it's people who are in the same industry that can also work just because everybody's going to have a perspective about what things that are working for them and things that are not working for them. And there's different structures you can set up on side. Sometimes people will, it's almost like a book club, but you're going to read a business book and you're going to commit to having something to share every single week or every two weeks or every month or whatever. And sometimes you do the hot seat thing where everybody presents a problem or something they're struggling with right now and gives the entire mastermind an opportunity to weigh in and offer suggestions and speculate on possibilities until it's like, okay, I've got 20 things on my list now and I can try all these and see what happens. Yeah. So, cause we so often get stuck and we try to lone wolf it and we try to do everything ourselves. And at some point it's like, I mean, I built a team for, for my current projects. I'm, I'm building a team for all my projects right now. (laughs) And that's a new paradigm for me. That's not how I used to operate. And Mm. it's just a different, it's a completely different experience when you're surrounded by like-minded, ambitious, powerful, kind people who want to see you succeed and you want to see them succeed. And the opportunities start coming faster when you have that supportive group. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you're saying that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that I probably should be in a mastermind, you know, (laughs) cause I, cause I've been involved with them and, and the value because sometimes you just, you simply just don't know the answer to a particular question. You know, yeah. you have a particular quandary and you're too close to the problem. You can't, and maybe you, you can't see past, you know, the immediate repercussions if you don't act on something or do act on something, you know, and, and 
then if the other people, like if it's your band say, you know, it's like, you know, should I keep this band member there? We've been having a lot of problems, but if I, if I let them go, then it's going to create this problem and all that. And, you know, the, the other people in the band are, you know, they have strong opinions that are, you know, going to be influenced. However, if you seek outside counsel, sometimes somebody who's maybe not even involved in music at all. Yeah. And they could just break it down to a few questions, the poignant questions that can ask you about, you know, what's the worst that could happen with this? And let's carry this out. If this person doesn't change, how is that going to affect the other band members? You know, all, you know, how's that going to affect the band overall? And it helps you kind of go, you're right. You know, it's, and, and having those people that you can call on, especially if they're, you know, cause with a band, you really have employees. A lot of times your problems are employee based. They're band people, band member based, you know, a lot of business owners, they have team members. They know what it's like to have somebody who's a problem child. Yeah. And you know, but maybe you're the problem. Child, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it can be so valuable. Uh, now you spoke of having a team, which is a, a little different topic. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I, and I wanted to make a point earlier when you talked about, you know, if you sign on with a record label, um, you know, and I'm certainly not opposed to it either, although it doesn't seem that, that labels are real hip on signing bands these days. No, nope. but, uh, I always tell people, so the good thing and the bad, the good news and the bad news about the music industry is that you don't need a record label. Yeah. The good news is, is that you, yes, you can release your music to where anybody in the world can hear it. We all know that drill, Yeah, but that's also the bad news. Because yeah. the bad news is, is that you have to do all the work. If, if you have to do the work of a label, if you don't have one, now That's you can, right. you can reach people directly, which you not you used to not be able to do 30 years ago, you know, unless, I mean, it just was much more challenging without the internet, but you know, with that, it's, it can be so overwhelming. There's so much to be done. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and I am a terrible person to ask about that. Cause I'm, it's not so much, I guess I am a control freak. I don't want to let go of that portion of it. I've got eight people working for me, but they basically all just play their instruments. You know, they don't help with any of the other stuff at, because I don't ask them to. So I'm, you know, again, a mastermind question to ask. Um, <laughs> it is kind of the wild west again. That's sort of the way that I've come to see the, the music business. And there's been a lot of changes, obviously, in the last 20, 30 years with music moving from CD to digital and then digital to streaming. And of course, there's going to be something else after streaming. Who knows what it'll be, hologram or whatever it ends up being. And and yeah. so... I think they already have that in Japan, don't they? Yeah. CD holograms. Exactly. They do yeah. have that. It's like, wow, I, I can't see myself going to that, but some people <laughs> some people really enjoy seeing an anime girl sing, so that's that's a thing. <laughs> but yeah, whatever you're into, man, you know. I guess the point is like you can go and do whatever you want. And that's mm. that's really the at the core of music entrepreneurship. It's like we need to define it. And I say, Yeah, but you can really do this how you want to. Like Mm -hmm. even with uh, setting up a business account, like business bank account, I don't suggest people set up a business bank account. There's usually tons of fees associated with it. I I suggest instead going and getting a, uh, a fee, no fee checking account and putting all your, your business money in there. Cause that way you're not being charged fees. So there's so many ways of, of looking at it. Um, just perspective wise that you can really create what it is that you want to create in your music career. That's, that's really the freedom of music entrepreneurship. I mean, within some boundaries, of course, obey by the godly and, and, and manly laws that we have. But aside from mm-hmm. that, you've got, you got a whole world to be able to set this up how you want it to be. And that is sometimes missed. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So now there's, but speaking of just hard work, you, there mm. there was a quote in your in your book where you said there is no justification when it comes to achieving success in business. You mm. know, if you recall that, um, yeah. Could you expand on that. Yeah. So this comes from a little a conference I went to, and it was network marketing oriented, and so business, not not specifically music oriented. But one of the speakers went up, and and what he basically shared was 
if you were to personify success and think of it as a person, success doesn't care whether you're sick, whether you're tired, whether you just had a long day, whether you're depressed or anxious, it, it just doesn't care. And so success will, will, you know, be bestowed upon you if you are doing the right things and you're showing up and being consistent and persistent. Now, none of that is to say, don't take a break. None of that is to say, you know, don't know your limits. I think there's different routines and schedules and, and methods that work for different people. I've tried a lot of different things and like, I'm, I'm done with the burnout schedule, right? I don't want to do that again because <laughs> the, the costs are much too high. But yeah, if you were to personify success, it doesn't care about your excuses and it doesn't care about your reasons and it doesn't care about your considerations. Uh, I'm yeah, scared to ask. True. Well, go ask anyway. Yeah, no, that's, that is great advice. Cause I mean, that applies to so many things Yeah, just in business in general and life in general. But, um, you know, with in the, in the music business, when I mean, it comes to writing songs, I mean, there's so often that, you know, I've written some songs that are, that were hits, you know, I've written some songs that were misses I've written, but the thing is sometimes I wait around, like I, I get song ideas in the morning. A lot of times mm. whenever I wake up, but I've gotten almost a little too used to that. And sometimes I'm like, well, why are you not, why are you not writing right now? Well, cause I haven't had any good ideas come to me. Well, maybe more ideas would come to me if I just sat down in front of the keyboard or if I just sat down with my bass. Or if I, you know, listen to some, sometimes I can just listen to a drum beat and be inspired, you know, and have a riff coming through my head, mm. you know, and, but I'm, it doesn't happen unless I put myself in my writing space and just do it and go, look, I don't have any ideas, but I know places I can go. Maybe I can play some chords and see what happens. Yeah. You know, and the, the same being true with like with, with marketing, you know, I have, I know that I have to do all the marketing for the band. If I don't do it, it doesn't get done just point blank. And some of the stuff's not fun. And I do that for, I do this for a living mm. and I still have not gotten to the point where I really enjoy the tech side of doing this stuff. I know how right. to do it. Um, you know, I started as a copywriter. I love to write. Yes. I don't love designing websites. I don't like messing with WordPress. I don't like messing with all this software and mm. stuff that I have to use as a marketing guy. But guess what? If I don't, it doesn't get done. And so I just got to suck it up and go, okay, well, this marketing has to get out. You know, again, success doesn't care if I don't like not working with right. WordPress, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's great advice. We all have uh, like a bar chart of strengths and weaknesses almost, right? And, and just like you, like I've developed my copywriting skills over time. That's probably not my strongest area, to be honest. Blogging and writing and, and perhaps podcasting are greater strengths for me. So yeah, we mm -hmm. all have this chart yeah. and, and that's where teams can come in for sure. It's like people can augment you in this area or supplement you in this area. People that are yeah. smarter than you, preferably, and, and have skills you do not have. Well, one thing that I have done just on a side note, and this is, this would be a good tip for anyone listening. Um, if you get to the point where you can, you have a little extra money and you can afford to, um, outsource some of this, I actually found a guy in the Philippines that, um, was in a band, which was not a requirement for the job, but, um, and I, cause I realized that with every gig that we had, I was doing the same patterns. I was always sending out, you know, emails and text messages and Facebook posts and Instagram, all this kind of, but it all followed a pattern. And I thought, you know, why am I doing this? Because I could easily teach somebody else to do it. Yeah. And frankly, I couldn't count on my band members to do it. And so I just, I've hired a guy in the Philippines who frankly works really cheap and does a fantastic job. He's got Photoshop skills. That is one software that I don't think I've ever even opened it. I don't know. Mm. I don't want to know how to use Photoshop, right. <laughs> you know? And so he has actually upped our game from a graphics perspective, helps me, you know, work on things that are my, more of my forte, which is the more, the big, bigger picture stuff. And he gets to do the, you know, cause we play every weekend and they come around with amazing regularity. And so I just need him to constantly put that out there. Um, you know, so that's been a good thing. But, uh, if you're looking for, you know, you can hire people just, you know, if you hire them overseas, 
a lot of times you're going to find them a lot less expensive. Um, you can go to a site like upwork.com yep. and find incredible people to work, uh, r- really cheap. So, uh, fiverr.com is another one where you can find people, but, um, you have been extremely uh, generous with your time. We're going almost on an hour here. I have this funny feeling that we could continue <laughs> talking, but easily, you know, yeah, we have to uh, get on with other things. I'm sure. Yes. So, David, just before we go, um, tell our audience how they can find you if they want to keep in touch and and or uh, find your your stuff. What do you have out there? Absolutely. So, if you're completely new to this, you just heard about this today. Music Entrepreneur HQ, content marketing musician. That whole ecosystem is new to you. Then the place to go to is musicentrepreneurhq.com/slash/join. Pick an ebook that interests you most, whether it's about Spotify or making money or YouTube or whatever, and we'll be in touch with you 100%. If you heard this interview and you're already like, "Hey, I got you. Uh, this is great. What's the next step I can take?" You can. Go and grab the Music Entrepreneur Code, my latest book and bestseller. You can go to musicentrepreneurhq.com slash buy code. And for any musicians who've been a part of our ecosystem and happen to be listening to this and they've been part of it for a long time and they're looking for next big steps they can take, not small ones, we've got a new premium membership set up. We're not accepting applications right this minute, but perhaps by the time this podcast episode comes out, we will be, you can go to music entrepreneur hq.com slash elite to learn more about elite players, all access pass our premium Academy online Academy for musicians. Nice. Great. Lots of resources there. Lots of great stuff. Uh, David, again, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's been a joy and maybe we can uh, do this again sometime. Thanks so much. I'd love to. Thank you.